Here we go. Okay, right, we are now live. So um, we don't have everybody with us at the moment, but I shall start. Um, welcome everyone to this session. Uh, today we're going to be looking at how ESG investing is creating a, a, an opportunity to foster sustainable growth. My name is Stuart Hutton. I am the Chief Investment Officer at Simply Ethical and also a co-founder at Other Dots Foundation. Peter Drucker once said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. However, I also like the fact that Paul McCartney also once said, there must be a better way to make things we want, a way that doesn't spoil the sky or the rain or the land. Now, today's discussion is with five exceptional speakers who I'll ask shortly to introduce themselves. We're looking to cover a couple of areas, focusing on one, whether the panel thinks that the pandemic has created an opportunity for transforming global economies while practicing ESG integration. And then secondly, also to look at how the panel feels investments are building in ESG credentials and how this will foster sustainable growth. Now, if you have a question, please use the side panel to ask any questions you may have during the session, and I'll do my best to bring those in either during the discussions or if time allows, for a bit of a Q&A towards the end. However, to start, I'm going to ask each of the panellists to take a minute or so to introduce themselves. So I'd like to ask you know, who you are, where you're from, and maybe something about the work you do in relation to the topic. I'd like to first go to Maha El-Togri. Maha, please. Great. Thank you so much, Stuart. Um, thanks for having me. Thanks to Harassas for hosting this panel. Um, I'm afraid I won't be able to um, quote Paul McCartney, but I'll... Uh, I'll <laughs> Quickly introduce myself. My name is Maha Altuki. Um, I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer at Bright Star Capital Partners. Um, Bright Star is a middle, a U.S. based. I think I'm the only uh, U.S. based person on this panel, but it, we're a U.S. based middle market private equity firm. We specialize in partnering with you know exceptional founders, families, entrepreneurs, and management teams, really to provide them with the requisite operational experience and capital they need to grow their businesses. Um, I'm the first uh, Chief Sustainability Officer at Bright Star. Um, you know, ever since the founding of our firm in 2016, we've had an ESG policy and processes. I think uh, I would be fair to say to really just check the box on uh, on ESG. And uh, we took the jump about, um, what, maybe it's been four or five months now. I started in September to bring in myself having expertise. I spent 10 years before this at the World Economic Forum leading activities around ESG, sustainable investing, impact investing, stakeholder capitalism, et cetera. And really, I'm, um, I'm, I've joined the firm to build up a more robust process and to really be a resource to our deal teams, our portfolio companies, and our LPs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'd now let, next like to ask um, Luis gomez Cobo. Could you please introduce yourself, please? Um, you're on mute, just to let you know. <laughs> Yes, I am. Uh, well, I'm <laughs> Luis, I'm originally from Mexico, uh, but lived about 10 years in China and then five years in Panama. And currently I'm based out of Zurich in Switzerland. Uh, I run a family investment holding company. Uh, we are uh, focused into investing mostly in private companies. We do have a portfolio of listed companies, but our core business is investing in private companies. Uh, we see ourselves and our vision as a, as an investment company, as conscious world citizens. And that's the motto, how we invest. Uh, we have a very long-term view of our investments. Uh, we never enter thinking that we're going to exit uh, because we have long-term committed capital. Mm. And, and the second, we try to invest only in companies where we have some influence on the decision making, ideally from the board and the governance. And the combination of both things makes us a very, you know, responsible investor because we know that we are going to be sitting there for 10 years, 20 years or more, ideally. Mm -hmm. And, and when you have that view, you know that, you know, your employees, your government, your mm -hmm. uh, local community, will be with you or against you mm -hmm. in the future. No? Yeah. And and we we like to see ourselves like the conscious capitalist brain of the company. And we we try to make money because that's mm -hmm. our job. Uh, but we try to make money in a long term and sustainable way. Mm -hmm. uh, we like the motto of uh, that we don't want to get 
or to become wealthy fast. Mm. We want to be wealthy always. Mm. No? Mm, we want I like to that. be able, yeah, we want, we want to, the community that we have to, to share that with us. Mm. And, and in general, I think that's a, been a very positive way looking at business. And uh, we are very slow decision makers for the same reason. And mm. uh, so we deploy capital very slowly. We don't have any pressure of doing so. And then because we're not flipping the capital back and forth, uh, once it's invested, it's more taking care of what you have invested in that thinking, okay, how do I exit? How do I flip it? And how do I make more money on the next round? Mm. And, and we think that's a, a very sensible and good approach for our business and uh, for our state of mind as well. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Jeanette van gogh Um Welcome, Jeanette. Please introduce yourself. Thank you so much. And uh, I would say good evening, actually, because I'm based in Denmark and it's now all dark outside. So uh, so the evening, the Friday evening is, is coming my way. Um, <laughs> but uh, I have a, a background from uh, from the financial sector and for almost 20 years or so, I've been heading up areas like sustainability or ESG, CSR, whatever it's been called at the time, uh, but also areas like marketing, communications, branding, and so on. And I've also been part of top management teams as well as a number of, uh, of boards. Um, so I've seen, you can say, the journey from where sustainability, ESG was very much uphill to mm. nowadays where it's becoming license to operate and, and, and part of core business strategies, both in, in the corporates, but also in the financial sector. Uh, today, I hold a portfolio of non-executive director roles. So that's sort of my, my core thing to do today. Uh, but I'm also the CEO of our own uh, family company, uh, where we do a, a number of investments, but from where we also do um, advisory services. So, so I have sort of a dual thing going on. So, so that's me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to ask Scott. Scott Making, could you please introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm a managing partner at Denim Capital, which has been an energy generalist and resources firm uh, that spun out of Hart's Endowment Fund back in 2004. Um, I ran what used to be called our power group, but we um, followed the trajectory of power from where it was to the clean energy um uh, focus that has uh, predominated for the last number of years, creating first um, in Europe and in Australia and uh, Latin America, uh, beginning in 2008 with predominantly wind and solar and battery projects. And I think the key differentiating factor for us over that period of time is that we create companies that uh, develop these projects and we back the development of them as opposed to buying existing operating assets or buying into existing companies uh, to date. Um, so we've uh, plowed in a, almost a billion dollars into uh, the pure renewable space. And then we've also done adjacencies such as gas fire generation in places like Africa and the like over the years. Um, <clears throat> I'm very proud to say <clears throat> that we have been one of the early members of Gresby, which people may be aware of, but it's, it's it was formed by a, a, some of the largest pension plans in the world to mm -hmm. uh, help uh, rate in a transparent manner. And I know you'll be getting into this. Um, how people perform uh, from the infrastructure space on ESG metrics. And we've rated highly on that um, consistently. And we just won the award from the ESG investing publication of the best sustainable infrastructure firm, period. And we were shortlisted for institutional investors, uh, short, um, sustainable infrastructure uh, firm as well. So that's our background. Thank you, Scott. That's very interesting. Thank you. Um, finally, we come to Evelyn Flugi. Um, Evelyn, please introduce yourself. Yes, thanks for having me. I dropped out for a second. I don't know what happened, but uh, I'm back. I'm in Zurich, Switzerland. So for me, it's also the evening, but but happy to be here. So I'm not not too too desperate for for the evening beer. Um, I run a company. I founded this company four years ago together with a group of people. We're now seven. We do innovation investing. So I think we're bringing the angle of how innovative new technologies solve a few ESG problems uh, to the table. What we do is innovation scoring of global equities as opposed to or along with ESG scoring. And, and we have two portfolios. Uh, we've grown quite significantly uh, over the last three years. Um, yeah, we're seven to eight people soon. And happy to be on board with this. Very interested in the 
the conversation with with the different people here mm. and happy to contribute an innovation angle i think uh to the esg conversation excellent thank you very much thank you so we're going to open up a little bit more now as i said i'm very happy for this to be kind of more conversation as opposed to taking turns um the, the kind of first point that I raised was to look at whether the panel thinks the pandemic has created an opportunity for kind of transforming global economies. There was a discussion earlier around, you know, this kind of rebirth of globalization and, you know, this whole, you know, incredible experience we've had over the last kind of five or 10 years with elements like uh, uh, Donald Trump, Brexit, um, you know, all these factors that come in, obviously, more recently as well, especially the pandemic. And the pandemic is obviously something which is very much the forefront of our minds. So, you know, while practicing ESG integrations, what do the panel think about this? Any any thoughts people would like to share? Can I take that? Uh, please, Liz, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, when, when the pandemic started, uh, I, I kind of got to the idea that the, you know, fighting a common enemy would make us more united, no? As mm. a, as, as, as a, as humanity, you know, and that, you know, we would become more aware that we don't live in isolation, you know, that, you know, a guy eating a, I don't know, pangolin or whatever in China can end up getting the president of the U.S. sick. Mm. And that, you know, in the same way, our actions, our thoughts are exponential and they can, you know, have impact in many other places of what we do. You know? And I do think that some people became more aware of that. Uh, but I think that, you know, how we have reacted as, as uh, countries, as companies, as regions, you know, uh, you know, the limitation of mobility because of the need of it, the strict level of restrictions in many countries of coming in and out from them, and the, now the impact of uh, logistical costs, the breaking of some of the value chains that we have, mm -hmm. I think all of it has created more uh, interesting of having self-sufficiency, uh, independence of uh, needs uh, for regions, for countries, for companies, and and uh, you know being a promoter of globalization. That's something that personally I don't like, mm -hmm. and I think that it has created a very different set of challenges. No, mm -hmm. and let's try to go too much into the current events in Ukraine, but I think this emphasizes even more. Mm -hmm. No. This thinks, this thoughts, and how people are reacting to to you know the possibility of you know uh, having lack of wheat or mm. lack of iron or mm. just the value chains of it, and and this this is not positive in terms of you know social mm. improvement and value creation as a as a as a global community. Mm. That's a, that's something that mm. is is not ideal in that sense. No? Yes, so Jeanette, you had your hand up there. <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I think what what happens in in a in a worldwide crisis like like the pandemic, but also like the the Ukraine mm. crisis and war that we see today is that that it shifts mindsets. Mm. Uh, and I would mm. say before the pandemic, uh, at least what we see in, in across the Nordics is that ESG was becoming increasingly mainstream when it came to uh, investment practices but there was very much a focus on the e so the climate crisis was sort of on top on everybody's agenda um, and then along came uh, the corona crisis and so on and suddenly there was a shift in terms of wow we also need to make sure we don't forget our people and as you said uh, what's happening with our value chain and, and how far is actually our responsibility in a crisis like that so the emphasis on the s the show, social piece i would say suddenly came back due to the because of the pandemic mm -hmm. and obviously i think we see that already in this when everybody is is trying to consider what does this war mean also for investors but also for companies at large in terms of expectations are rising every day mm -hmm. so that it's not enough for a company necessarily just to follow uh, foreign policy but actually mm -hmm. stakeholder expectations are no, now so high that they have to be even further ahead mm -hmm. taking away their groceries and so on you know so it's um, mm -hmm. it's new dilemmas coming uh, because of a crisis like this and it was the same with the pandemic it's mm, raining. Maha, you, you, you had something to say there, definitely, to add in. No, I mean, I think just building on what uh, Luisa and Jeanette said, 
you know, it's, I can't believe we're starting the third year almost of this, right? So when you when you think back to uh, to to the to the early days of COVID, there really was this sense, I think, that exactly as Jeanette said, that the pandemic awakened people to the fact that ESG is more than just a climate crisis, right? a, a very real crisis. But and especially in this country, you know, with the events then that occurred around George Floyd and Black Lives Matter and a number of other things, just what we observed in terms of the social impact of um, of COVID uh, really, really did shine a spotlight on the, the need to think about stake, you know, your customers, your employees, your, the communities that we live in. I think in some ways, all things that have been around for a long time, maybe mm. somewhat forgotten, you know, Jeanette said she was around from, you know, she's, she remembers the CSR days, which many of us do. But I, I do think that there's, the, the pandemic has really um, hopefully focused people's attentions in a way maybe that it just hadn't. And now, obviously, with the crisis in Europe, I mean, that's just a whole other overlay of things that I don't feel as closely sitting here in New York. But I, I you know, obviously, we watch the news and talk to people and just the, the sense of the world really being on this kind of in a strange place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll add maybe an investor's or the investors we speak to and, and their perspective. And I think we could see it in the markets. Right. So. For us, it was almost, uh, it was a, a little bit of a surprise to have the ESG turnaround, not the social impact, but mm -hmm. I'll tell you where I'm getting at. The pandemic made investors aware pretty quickly that digitalization, decentralization and innovative innovations were needed, right? Mm -hmm. And it gave this run on the tech sector, a massive renewed boost, right? Mm -hmm. To the point where people didn't know where else to go and invested in very unprofitable, very hopeful R&D technologies mm -hmm. uh, without any returns or without any, any earnings, right? So it kind of overdid that expectation of technology to be the solution to this kind of problem of being mm -hmm. locked in, right? And in all these crises, I mean, in, in the current crisis, if you will, the technology people are running towards is, 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 uh, is, is weapons technology, again, right? But it's, mm -hmm. it's technology, it's always innovation that investor, investors fly to. So at the end of the day, for investors, I think what created the hunt for ESG also, I'm not trying to say that, that anybody's trying to greenwash as an investor, as a, um, but ESG was imposed by the regulators. So, you know, mm. what then happened on our side of things is, is we thought, thought people are starting to get that innovation happens in every industry and that they need to have it, right? And, and we, we got a lot of attention on, on us and our products. But then came the regulators slamming in this ESG criteria. And since then, I have to say, in the investment world, a lot of focus has been getting around to these ESG criteria in your mm. portfolio and the reporting done. So mm. it's a little bit disappointing that, that something like this is, is being imposed in a way that isn't very fruitful, I think, mm. um, to, to, to bring another flavor maybe to that, because it should be what the previous speakers already said, right? It should really, really be about improving things and not just about companies filling out a report. Um, so, so I wonder, you know, if we're really heading in, in, in the right direction overall, you know, from an investment perspective. And then I guess, you know, what, what it feels like national interests became all of a sudden, first there was this social gathering, we're all in this together, but then it became the protection of, of na you know, America first or something first, let's keep the vaccine to ourselves. And then, you know, human nature came back and, and decentralization and protecting national interests became the flavor of the day, I, you know, is what we felt. And I think we have, again, you know, in, in Russia, um, that example of, of, of that urge coming back to, to, you know, so I don't think it's only been this positive thing that's come from it, sadly. There's been protectionism and nationalism spurred by it as well. And, that, and there's no doubt that's been quite a disruptive element to this. And yeah. that, that push and pull of regulation versus demand is always going to be something that the, you know, the intermediate investment side is going to find difficult. Scott, uh, please come in. Um, some thoughts yeah. from yourself. Well, I, I agree with what a lot has been said. I guess I, um, you know, I'm American, but I'm, <clears throat> I'm based in London. And I, I felt less of that pull of regulation. So I'm mm -hmm. interested about that because I, I kind of feel when you think about what's happened, particularly, again, on the climate change side, uh, that it's like the joke about the French politician who is sitting there giving an interview to somebody with his feet up on the desk, and then he sees a crowd walking by, and he tells the interviewer, the journalist, I'm sorry, I, I've got to stop. There's a bunch of people going somewhere. I have to see where they're going so I can lead them. Um, you know, what, what, what's happened is, 
and I'll, again, I'll start with climate change because it's real and there's reports that have come out during the pandemic about it. Look, at, we, if you map out um, CO2, man-made CO2 emissions and you put them against increase in temperature, you're no surprise that they, they track quite nicely. Mm-hmm. But what people don't pay attention to is weather-related insurance claims also track out track it uh, very tightly in a very unfortunate way. We've had the highest weather-related insurance claims, and they keep on growing and growing. And so, um, before governments have done anything, you've had tens and tens of trillions of dollars of pension plan, plan insurance company money, and the like that <clears throat> have formed these alliances for net zero. Um, so that was already, you know, that's already as its own sort of impetus <clears throat> well in advance of what many governments, uh, you know, have, have been able to do. And then <clears throat> with the pandemic, I do think that, you know, as people went out and polled, as J.P. Morgan polled a bunch of, you know, about 13 trillion of institutional capital. And they said, do you think the pandemic is going to make people more interested in the pure ESG and sustainability? 71% said yes. 29% maybe had their heads up their bottoms. I'm not really sure, but 71% certainly said yes. And I think there's been this impetus for the social stuff that's grown and grown and grown to, to the point where you get these immediate reactions to what Russia has done. Yeah, it's very interesting. Of, you know, of regulations. Uh, you know, so the UK, where I live, right, begrudgingly the Tory party, who's got a lot of financing from Russians, begrudgingly, you know, they're going to start to out some of those Russians. Uh, but it's been other companies that have said on their own, I'm not going to be buying Russian oil or I'm, um, Apple, I'm not going to sell more things. in." so they've, they've gotten out in front of it. And, you know, that's light speed ahead of, mm-hmm. of where we would have been three or four years ago. And I think the pandemic has played a large part in increasing the, the speed of transparency to mm-hmm. getting action from people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think it's created a, a cultural shift in how this could be managed. And you're absolutely right. And, you know, some of the sanctions and the way corporate sanctions have come into place, you know, their own determination has been been quite rapid. There's been other ones where you kind of questioned they haven't said or done anything. So what's going on? It's almost like they're, they're kind of shoring up ready to make a decision but wait and see what everyone else does. Jeanette, you're, you're going to come in with something there, please. Yeah, yeah. so I think it's interesting because what, what's really driving this development, and, and, and for me, I do see a positive development in terms of ESG investments going in, in mm. the right uh, direction. So is it regulation or is it actually the market driving it? And I would say, of course, regulation, and especially what's coming out now from, um, of the EU in terms of the Green Deal, uh, sustainable finance, new taxonomy, of course, that will affect how things are done in terms of what is green and what is not. And it puts an enormous pressure on the financial sector in a broader sense. But at the same time, I also feel that the market is driving this because customers, employees, stakeholders in general, they will not they will not respect companies or investors if they do not work with this. So there's also a huge pressure from the market in, 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 in itself. And what I see in the Nordics is actually that, that a number of investors, they are now putting pressure on companies because they have the power to say, yeah, we want to see how are you running your business models. You know, they, they vote at the AGMs. Uh, they want to see diversity in, in boards and top management. So, so there are also many, many things coming from the investor group because they, they understand they have the power to do so and it's better for their investments, basically. Mm. Mm. Yes, that's really interesting. That demand is is growing. There's no doubt about it. It comes with an element of education. We haven't mentioned that in some ways, and it's not kind of part of the discussion maybe today, but actually it's integral to everything that goes on here. Um, And I I think this is where perhaps, you know, it's quite interesting to lead on to that kind of second part of the discussion around now how building ESG credentials is going to foster sustainable growth. What exactly does this mean in some ways? Um, I mean, I mean, Lewis, would you like to come in to perhaps offer some thoughts around that or maybe another part, another area? I'll let someone to start this. Yeah, no problem. Anybody yeah. else would like to, to start there? I mean, certainly in my height, yeah. Um, Stuart, say that again. I mean, I, I think what we're seeing is, um, you know, I think what the evolution that we're experiencing, that we're all living is is ESG, as we call it today, mm. is kind of evolved from um, values-based kind of approach, right? Where people were talking about exclusions or, you know, the faith-based institutions were looking at sin stocks or what have you. So you've gone from a more of a values and moral type argument 
to, I think, exactly what Scott and Jeanette were saying. You, you're, now we're talking about value, right? And we're talking about um, investment analysis that is as rigorous when it comes to material ESG factors. And, you know, the U.S., everybody likes to talk about materiality. But it, those types of ESG factors where do have a financial impact, you treat them in the same way that you've treated, that you treat any sort of financial discussion, mm-hmm. right? And I think that's the evolution that we're seeing where people are talking more about, you know, value preservation and now a little bit of value creation. I think that's a little fuzzy still. And the direct links in the, in the climate space, it's, it's much more clear, I think, where innovation really is, you know, coming, coming to play. And I think this notion that we were talking about just earlier, regulation or what have you, it's almost like it's not a perfect storm. Storm is the wrong analogy, but it's like mm-hmm. virtuous, right? You have the regulators, especially in Europe. You have the organizations that um, Scott was talking about, you know, whether it's mm-hmm. financial institution or what have you. Anyways, there's also pressure. I don't want to take up too much time on metrics and reporting. So, you know, we're, we're this arc of becoming more, I guess, professional in some ways or whatever the right word is where you're treating these things with the, the rigor that they deserve. Mm-hmm. I agree. Um, I, I think we're seeing that as well. I think uh, at the same time, you know, integrating this into investment processes uh, on any side, and I'd be very curious to see how, you know, what, what Lewis is going to say about, about how you're thinking about mm-hmm. it when, when you're mm-hmm. reallocating investments. Um, <laughs> is exactly, I think we're still waiting on some of this transparency, right? Because people are still mm-hmm. getting their head around on what they want to be transparent on and how. Because the exclusion mm-hmm. criteria was this was this kind of easy way out in a way, right? You excluded anything that you thought was bad or was dirty. But actually, you know, I mean, to take the oil industry as an example, these are some of the biggest balance sheets. <laughs> these are some of the <laughs> biggest possible spenders. Uh, and there's, you know, they're going to have to move into spending it on, on innovation. And I think I'm not trying to be negative on regulation, right? But but when uh, we have we have calls with with kind of technology experts, uh, we just had our think tank weeks this last three weeks where we speak with different experts on what's going on, what's really possible, right? So I think sometimes regulation just expects the impossible, and and one topic here is is you know a topic in Europe and Germany, hydrogen subsidies, if you will, mm. you know the incentivize mm. and incentivizing. <clears throat> of hydrogen product projects to, you know, to create energy out of hydrogen. And really all of our experts conclude that if there was no regulatory incentive, really, the natural, there would no be, no, there would be no economic reason for any kind of oil company or any company to get involved in hydrogen. They're all fruits to create mm-hmm. a better energy transition, yeah. um, but they're not doing it now, right? So these companies aren't investing along what they're capable of doing right mm-hmm. and well because regulation is incentivizing them in a direction that doesn't even play to them mm-hmm. and so i think you know i guess that's one element uh, I, I don't think regulation or policy is always deciding that way but there there could be more conversation between yeah the really the the technology industries and politics and and regulators to to kind of have a conversation about what's short term doable so that we're not incentivizing people or industries to move away from what's dirty and bad and expecting them to move straight to what's perfect. Mm. We mm. need to incentivize mm. the short term transition. So, mm. you know, my element of, of how regulation might be playing not the perfect role here is, is based on those kind of <laughs> happenings. Mm. Yeah, certainly. Uh, Scott, please. But I think to Evelyn's point, case in point right now is the EU struggling with how to treat gas with a taxonomy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, for a while there, at least a week, I thought that they took this amazingly sane approach. Um, mm-hmm. But as the you know questions came out and the answers came out and everything else, they've gone back to huddle on it. And I don't know what they're going to come back out with. But, mm-hmm. you know, my field of, uh, of energy transition <coughs> um, it's, you know, we're we're plowing lots of money in wind and solar and batteries and all this, but mm. uh, hydrogen's not affordable yet. Some of the other newer technologies that will come quicker than we think for energy mm-hmm. storage and taking renewable energy and making industrial heat out of it. I think they'll be there sooner than we think. Mm. But you have to put a stake in the ground and say, mm. what is my intermediate fuel? And gas mm. has got to be that until hydrogen's more affordable. Mm. Uh, which people are planning for. I mean, the people who are putting up gas turbines right now are 
are doing that, thinking about dual fuel and then ultimately uh, pure hydrogen in terms of how they're going about doing that. So that's, you know, that will happen. But you have to have sufficient sort of regulatory clarity to allow some gas generation, because otherwise what happens is in the United States and in the UK right now and in continental Europe, we're burning more coal. Mm. <laughs> I mean, we're burning more coal, and and that is a disgrace. I mean, that is absolute disgrace. Um, and so, I think that's a failure in each of these jurisdictions <coughs> of regulatory planning. I mean, the United States had four years of failure with Trump in charge, who wanted you know to eat coal for breakfast. But but even as such, to try to try to uh, <coughs> um, set forth a, a reasonable framework where you can say gas will have a limited shelf life. I hope the EU comes out and, and, and gets something like that that works because we need, you know, we need these interim solutions mm -hmm. to bridge the gap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting. I, I mean, I think one of the key facts here, I mean, we, we're kind of picking up with is, is edging towards, you know, first, certainly this kind of consensus around what a, a transitionary kind of perspective looks like. And that's so, that's so key because people have this determination of what it wants to be like, you know, where we need to be. And if you get to the kind of extremities around achieving that, and that comes down to kind of, you know, the impact that's required. And I think you're talking around kind of ESG metrics. One of the <clears> issues <throat> I have often, we, and we see kind of when drilling down into this in terms of some of the investments, is that a lot of the data is historical. And a lot of the, well, most of the data is historical. Well, sorry, you know, we don't have many crystal balls working these days. And I think the other factor is that, you know, it doesn't predict going forward what's going to be in the future, just like investments don't. So the creation of impact and impact data is going to become more and more relevant. Um, I mean, any thoughts around that or any other areas you'd like to share? Jeanette, please, yeah. No, it's, it's, I was just building on, on what was said before. Mm. And I think the interesting thing is what is really the role of the financial sector, no matter whether we speak about investors or banks, uh, then you can say, I mean, as laid out in, in the EU regulation, the roles is to help finance the, the transition of society. And then the question comes in, do you just want to be an investor for something that is already green? Or do you actually help fund mm -hmm. the journey to becoming green? Mm -hmm. Because it's easy for an investor to say, yeah, we exclude, we're just in there when it's already good. But actually, I think we, we need investors to stay in there and, and, and help make the transition happen happening. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's also an interesting thing to, um, to discuss and understand. Let me build on that, Janet. So uh, in terms of you know ESG credentials, the problem that you have in, in listed companies is that there is so many different frameworks, measures, key indicators, metrics, mm -hmm. the data usage, uh, qualitative analysis. It's all very blurred. It's really, really mm -hmm. hard to be able to say, okay, this is uh, actually a, a good ESG credential. Okay, tell me what is that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yeah. and and you know, when you're looking at annual report and trying to invest in a public company and selecting a company for the credentials, it, it's so manipulative. It's, it's mm -hmm. very easy to manipulate. You know? it's, it's, it's hard to choose. No, and, you know, when you're a relatively small outlet, you can actually cherry pick. You know? But you're ma managing billions or trillions of dollars as the large funds. How do you allocate those resources credibly? Mm -hmm. No, it's, 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 it's no way you can do it no? mm -hmm. in a credible way today. No, It's, it's just very, very complicated. No? Uh, we have the advantage as a group is where small is not a huge company uh, and we use we don't use an exclusionary screening for investments uh, we uh, we work much more harder on the private investments not direct investments into medium small size companies and we our goal is not to invest in the most green company no we don't even look at investing or seeing as impact investors no Mm -hmm. uh, which is you know, a very interesting way to look at investing. You know, we, we see ourselves you know, very traditional investors into traditional industries. But again, we see ourselves as someone that can drive businesses into value change because all these traditional industries are needed as well. No? We mm -hmm. have an equipment leasing company, Peru, leasing equipment to mining. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is, does sound very ESG, no? but hey, we need the copper, we need the gold, we need all these materials. Mm -hmm. And you know, we do it on a responsible way. We pay our people well, we pay the insurance. In Peru, that's very, in Switzerland, it's, it's business as normal, no? In Peru, 75% of the economy is informal, mm. 75%. <laughs> so if you're the company doing right things properly and 
booking everything and making sure that you know all your equipment, are, are equipment is well taken care of and things are important mm -hmm. in very small ways mm -hmm. and and that for us is is a way that we drive impact no mm -hmm. and then when we look at a company because it's small then you we can create our own esg credential no? we decide okay what do we want to have what do we want to measure what do we want? and and that helps a lot no mm -hmm. uh, as we speak we are setting up uh, ESG committees in medium-sized companies, in boards of medium-sized companies, and and mm -hmm. that's something. It's a non-listed company. They don't need it. They don't need to report for it. Mm -hmm. But suddenly the company says, "Hey, this is something I want to do," mm -hmm. because we believe that's important for the company. And that, I think that's that's also mm -hmm. important though, as as an investor. It kind of goes back to what you were saying right at the beginning. We were saying, you know, taking care of what you have invested in. I think that's a really, really, uh, I think it's a fantastic way of kind of positioning it. Scott, uh, you had something to add to that, please. Well, I think, you know, it's interesting because when you read the <clears throat> even the quality uh, publication like the Financial Times, you get this sense that um, ESG is going in and out of favor in the investing public and everything. And I think that's because there's across the board of the things, topics that we've talked about, <clears throat> there's, a, I think, a bifurcation between private investment capital mm. and, and the public markets. Um, and what, what <clears throat> the sort of problems that we're grappling with are getting solved, and they're not solved right now, but they are getting solved in the private uh, capital markets, driven by largely by the large institutional investors who are LPs to private equity funds, infrastructure investors and the like. They're pushing, they're pushing that very hard and they have the ability to do that. <clears throat> so for example, right now there's a data convergence project trying to put all this data together and, and have it in a sense that we can all use and measure apples to apples and Boston Consulting Group is going to sort of put all that together. Uh, we've worked hard with Gresby for the infrastructure side to do that. So it's these things are moving forward. There's not a solution today. We know some of these answers are going to be wrong, but, but there will at least be some sort of more transparency there. When you go to the public markets, it's very difficult. And I think people feel that they can vote with their feet um, mm -hmm. a lot more. And so it, you can be flavor of the day. And I honestly don't know how and when we're going to get to a situation where public shareholders can get a view of just how good somebody is in terms of ESG. So for us, right, it's easy. We, we put together um, an ESG report as we're looking at any investment. We, you know, we measure everything, on, you know, a whole bunch of scores on E, S, and G, and then we then map them out over time and what's the progress that's going to be made and where were they a year ago and where are they today? Mm. Very difficult, I think, in the public markets. Yeah, I think uh, I will speak to that with our own experience, right? Because uh, and speaking to what both of you said and, and Louis touched as well on is we actually did this exercise where we applied just to the MSCI all country world and other indexes. It, you know, we did trials with all these ESG providers <laughs> and applied the same exclusion criteria or the same stuff and something else popped out every single time, you know, to the point where Next Era Energy was a bad company because it had, you know, legacy business and, and nuclear. But what we decided to do, not with the aim at ESG in the sense of, 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 of those three letters, but with the aim at sustainability in the sense of being able to survive, adapt, progress, is we applied, we built our own innovation scoring system. I'm speaking my own book now, right? But we realized that what creates the sustainability, what creates solutions to problems is usually innovation. It's some new technology. Sometimes the convergence of three things and one new thing, you know, creates something that's able to, to move the world forward. And so applying an innovation screen on the MSCI All Country, for example, we created a 300 stock portfolio and every single ESG scoring system, including every tailor-made one that our clients have, sometimes they don't use the MSCI or the ISS, gave us a score that was, you know, a double A AA or a triple A. And, so, and our conclusion was if you, and this is value chain innovation, I'm not speaking, you know, when we're having the conversation about can you do this in private markets or can you do this with listed equities, every single private company that is building up some sort of end technology will need a supply chain. They'll buy semiconductors, they'll buy software, they'll buy new materials, and they'll buy it somewhere where it's possible, right? So the listed equity space, you know, might act maybe not as the end provider of a solution, 
but still can act as the value chain of these private company solutions. And I think, you know, that is a, a, a way to go about it where you can avoid this problem. We're currently not really applying ESG screens. We're applying them afterwards to, to run a check if we still fulfill them. And we're doing the SFDR reporting, et cetera. Um, but I think there's value also in, in the listed market, maybe just not where, where you might be looking for it. And Lou mentioned one thing, which I think we're not really aware of, which is this impact. And, you know, it really needs to happen in emerging markets to make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. and we're often very, very focused on, on you know, on, on the West, on, on the US, on, on Europe, the policies there. Um, but we're not going to really make a difference in the world if, if we don't move you know, faster on, on in those other areas as well. Mm. And, I, and I think that leads into kind of the conversation around maybe also focusing on startups and SMEs. We you know we often talk about the big oil and gas companies, but I, or whatever. I mean, actually, you know, you think of the tens of hundreds of thousands of SMEs and startups across the world, especially in emerging markets, you know, and Middle East and places like that, where we're doing work with at the moment, you know, and they are places you can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Jeanette. Yeah, maybe just a final point on, on the reporting and the data piece. I think the banks especially are also going to drive this because nowadays, I mean, a bank, if they want to do any financing, whether it's a startup or it's a big corporate, they will also look at ESG data as part of their risk management processes. Mm -hmm. So what I see across the Nordics is that they are also now trying to help, especially the smaller companies in terms of figuring out what are then the relevant data that they should provide because it will affect their cost of capital. Uh, and if they do this right, the smaller companies or the bigger companies, I mean, they can get access to green financing or ESG link financing. Uh, and then it's a positive thing. But I do agree now data is all over the place. But I think the banks uh, and the financial sector will help solve this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, well, maybe. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, Stuart, maybe just to build on some of the comments that were made by Scott and others around the importance of the middle market and SMEs. And your point also, like, you know, we're a middle market private equity investor. And so many of the companies that we, we invest in don't have the capacity or the capability. And that's a big part of our role. And we have the ability to engage with them, right, through our, you know, we have aligned incentives, et cetera, et cetera, all the things that we know about the mm -hmm. private equity model that actually make it quite um, capable, unlike in the public markets, of affecting change in this area, and so I think that's that's a that's really important um, point. I do think that we're starting to see more data appear also for private companies. Less so, I think the data convergence project Scott is a great one. I think you know watch the International Sustainability Standards Boards as it tries to address you know the same yeah. set of issues in the yeah. public markets. Um, a, a Herculean task, but certainly one that'll come. But, but again, like I do think people forget, some tend to forget about like this large swath of small and medium sized enterprises and how important they are around the world, whether it's in the U S or, or in other countries and, and really taking, a, mm. you know, Stuart, you and I, again, I don't want to, you and I talked about when we spoke independently, ESG is just so big, you know, you almost have a discussion on climate, you need to have a discussion on what you're doing on social factors, but you know that that it's a well, it's we, a quite a expansive area. We hardly tapped into the G bit. I mean, we talked a little bit about kind of employment rights things. I mean, there a little bit, but G is a factor that if you don't get that right, the ENS is not going to matter, you know, mm -hmm. because you're never going to get that right. And we're, we're coming to the end of our time now. We've only got maybe a kind of two or three minutes left, so it would be quite nice if everyone had maybe just a, a, a final thought just to share um with the people obviously listening in so i mean happy to start uh um jeanette perhaps i'm going to go around the table in my screen actually now so we have to do it so jeanette maybe a final thought please no i yeah what to say now i, I just say that i think esg investing is here to stay it's only becoming bigger and bigger over the years and we've just mm -hmm. seen the beginning of it mm, excellent thank you lewis yeah well uh, i would like to comment on the on the governance very quickly mm -hmm. just a question there how can a company be sustainable if without proper governance no mm -hmm. you know you can see companies disappear overnight because of poor decision making mm -hmm. for corrupted business practices for excessive risk taking mm -hmm. or just simply you know grid grid driven decisions no mm -hmm. it's a uh, with poor governance you you're never able to be sustainable mm -hmm. no and there's mm -hmm. very very uh, obvious stories about this. Mm -hmm. 
Scott, have you got a, a final word you'd like to share this? It, this is only going in one direction. <laughs> I mean, there'll be d- different speeds, but it's only going in one direction. Uh, yeah. So that's not to rule out there'll be value investors that will play in and out of this overall. People can make money doing non-ESG things. There'll be a lot of that. Mm-hmm. But overall, it's only going in one direction. Mm-hmm. Maha, I found a thought, uh, please. Yeah, just to build on what Scott said, um, only going in one direction for sure. And I think the challenge for this industry is going to be integration throughout a company or business. You know, ESG can't be siloed. It really is part and parcel of changing and adapting the operations of the business. Mm. No, thank you. Evelyn, a final I have the luxury of, of talking after everybody else, but I agree. I think, I mean, we're <laughs> definitely feeling the same thing that it's going in, in one direction. Mm. Um, I think investors, to, to Jeanette's point, have, have an Im- Im- immense role, but also companies with, with huge balance sheets are investors mm. as well, not mm. just you know institutional investors. And I think we need to make sure that they're rightly incentivized as well. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, everybody, for sharing your thoughts and wisdom on this panel. It's uh, really appreciative for your time as well. Um, some exceptional kind of conversation here. Thank you very much. And, uh, and Maha, you mentioned about challenge. I think this is something we need to kind of rise to. And uh, uh, Kofi Annan once said that our biggest challenge in this new century is to take an idea that seems abstract, uh, sustainable development, and turn it into a reality for all the world's people. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate that. And uh, um, obviously enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Nice to meet Bye-bye. you all.